Hello, my name is Eric Bowers and my artist name is The Golden Repair. Welcome to my webcast. Today I'm with Laurel Sugden. Laurel is a doctoral student in interdisciplinary studies supervised by Wade Davis and Zachary Walsh at the University of British Columbia. Born and raised in the enchanted flathead watershed of Montana, she grew up with an appreciation for the medicine plants of the Rocky Mountains. She has traveled throughout Latin America and spent four months studying with San Pedro Curanderos in the Peruvian Andes. Her research interests center on Andean cultural history, psychedelic therapy, and facilitating cross disciplinary and multi-generational conversations that imagine the future of plant medicines in globalized society. And Laurel is in love with barefoot hikes, meditation, and cold water swimming. I love that you put that in your bio. <laughs> yeah, I think usually we just get kind of a list of, of professional uh, details and and what we really care about is is cold water and and being barefoot. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so welcome, Laurel. Thanks so much for doing this. And well, thanks. Glad to be here, Eric. Yeah, I uh, I saw your talk at the psychedelic uh, the Spirit Plant Medicine Conference last fall. I really enjoyed it. Saw another interview with you as well, and uh, been really looking forward to this. Um, you're in yeah, you're UBC. You're in Vancouver right now, but you grew up in Montana. And I'd love to know just a little bit of what was life like for you growing up in Montana? Were you in the wilderness of Montana? Were you in a city or a bit of both? Yeah, so I grew up in uh, Big Fork, Montana, which is at the north end of Flathead Lake, um, which I think is the largest freshwater lake uh, west of the Mississippi. Um, so I grew up sort of between lake and mountains and, and there's a, you know, a, a small community there. It's a, a valley with several scattered towns, but, um, just incredible, you know, access to nature. I think my parents, um, you know, bought the house that I grew up in or saw the ad for it on, on their way up to a, a hiking area uh, that's that's in the mountains behind the house I grew up in. So, um, you know, it was uh, very different living in Vancouver. It's actually my first uh, time sort of living in a city. Um, and and it, it's really, making me feel so so blessed for for where I grew up and how I grew up and you know my uh, sort of elementary school uh, days there were 12 15 students in wow. in my class and and after school it was sort of uh, running out to the woods to play every day and um, just getting to spend a lot of time in, in the mountains and in ancient uh, Blackfeet uh, land and um beautiful 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 place to grow up is blackfeet is that the name of the indigenous people there yeah flathead and blackfeet, flathead and blackfeet. did mm -hmm. you ever get down the flathead river uh yeah yeah the um i mean it's a it's a long river but yeah, yeah. Fl the flathead or, yeah. yeah i i went uh, i used to raft uh just north of there uh in, in uh, Golden, and I uh, had friends who had been on the Flathead River, so I knew a little bit about that area. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, yeah, it's it's been so interesting to see how it's changed too, because there's Glacier Park right there, and and you know Flathead Lake, and it's so beautiful that a lot of um, Californians and and sort of a lot of people want to be there, yeah. um, which is is understandable. So it's really exploded in in population and is changing quite a bit. And what kind of medicinal plants were you into when you were there? You, in the um, bio, it says you were exploring the medicinal plants of the Rocky Mountains. So what, what were some of those? Yeah, so um, maybe not in, uh, in the way uh, of, of psychedelic medicines as we're talking about, certainly. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I suppose um, there's a, a, a line between medicinal and, and edible plants that I, I think food is really our medicine. Um, right. So, uh, you know, buffalo berry and, um, and glacier lilies and um, just the, 
it's one thing that's so fascinating to me is um, how varied the the plant diet uh, in in Montana must have been and, and was. Um, you know, it's it's not as as though the ancient people were eating uh, sort of a um, one single staple sort of um, exclusively, but but really just drawing on on so many different sources of food um, and and connecting with the land in so many different different ways. Yeah. And in, in in one of the talks I heard from you, you you got to a place in your life where you were going through a really stressful period. I think you were just finishing a school year university. There was a difficult relationship going on and, and you decided to travel to Peru. Is that right? Am I capturing that about right? It was, yeah, that was, I guess that was at the end of 2016. Okay. Um, yeah, um, and it was, it was, yeah, I was going to school at uh, Western Washington University down in Bellingham and you know, I just finished up my molecular biology degree, and um, you know, it's it's sort of interesting when you you get to a point where um, you know, which I think we all get to, where um, everything that people said was what you were supposed to do. Uh, you know, you've sort of done done a lot of that, and um, and and there's just always one more thing. You know, there's always the next step. There's always uh, sort of you know, looking for for the right job or 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 doing the next right thing, and uh, it never ends. You know, there's there's always something else that we should be doing, and um, and I think when when I got to that point and and looked around and said, "Wow, you know, this isn't this isn't working for me," and and happiness doesn't come from those things. Um, I you know sort of so to speak, dump the whole box of Legos out on the floor and, and <laughs> went traveling and, uh, you know, just really wanted that new experience. And was there a reason you chose Peru? You know, I, I've been asked that question and I was asked the question at the time and I still don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, you know, I traveled in Mexico and, and Guatemala, um, and and spent quite a bit of time and so i knew i wanted to go to latin america but mm -hmm. peru specifically um you know certainly the mountains drew me uh and really i, I didn't have any uh, ideas about drinking ayahuasca or drinking san pedro i didn't know what san pedro was i didn't uh sort of know anything about that whole world uh, before i went so that was that was sort of a happy accident yeah, a significant life-changing happy accident it sounds like <laughs> <laughs> happens that way right <laughs> yeah. yeah i love that part of I'm, i've for a long time been fascinated about major shifts in life and particularly around that that uh you know that point that people reach where they realize i'm not happy or this isn't fulfilling or there's got to be something more than just knocking off goals in life and so on and mm. yeah so that was a piece that really stuck up for me in your story that you you got to that point and decided to take a, a leap in a different direction mm. and in and, and the other part uh, I really loved of your story or another part mm. I really loved of your story is, is I think if I remember this right that just before taking San Pedro you had the thought of I wonder if this will change my life <laughs> <laughs> that exact thought yeah yep. yeah it was it was you know the morning and and heading up into the mountains and you know i hadn't i hadn't overthought about it too much you know i'd i'd spent a week in in the wilderness in the vilcanota and and sort of you know meditated and everything but i hadn't uh, really um sort of realized the full significance of what I was doing. And I, it was just a passing thought, like, huh, I wonder if I'm going to be different after this. <laughs> uh, and and turned out the answer was yes. Yeah. <laughs> I want to get to that more in a second. But how did it, so you before this had had no plant medicine experience, is that right? Uh, no, I not plants. I, I'd worked a little bit with mushrooms or taking mushrooms uh you know more or less recreationally a, a couple times in in the woods in washington okay. um, and so you know i've had 
sort of psychedelic experiences, but not um, not in ceremonial awesome. setting. So can you tell us a little bit about how it, it doesn't sound like you went to Peru with the intentions to try plant medicine. So how did it come about that you decided to to take to take it? Yeah, um, well, I guess uh, I was doing a, sort of all of these backpacking trips and um, in in Cusco or, you know, I'm going to Machu Picchu um, in the Vilcanota near Azangate, south of Cusco um, in the Cordillera Blanca. And I would just, you know, I'd go into the mountains and, um, and I was having all of these crazy dreams and I didn't know whether it was the altitude or, um, or, you know, the not being able to eat because of the altitude or, or what, but um, I was feeling this connection to to the land and to the mountains uh, and to the place that I hadn't exactly felt before. Um, and, I, and I was having dreams about plants. Um, and then at some point um, I was, uh, I met the, this group of, of people from Australia who had just uh, come from an ayahuasca retreat in Iquitos. And, and, you know, I'd heard, I'd heard about ayahuasca a few years ago and, you know, hadn't really given it more than a passing thought. And, um, really, really connected with these people and said, wow, maybe this is what I came here to do mm -hmm. um, after hearing a little bit about it. So, um, you know, I sort of got back from that, that backpacking trip and, and uh, tried to find ayahuasca and, you know, was uh, looking through centers and, and I couldn't afford anything and sort of trying to, trying to find, uh, you know, where I could take ayahuasca. And uh, it just, every lead just sort of fell through. Nothing worked, nothing worked, nothing worked. Um, and so I just sort of sighed and said, okay, it's not, that's it, I gave up. And um, and that very day, a, a woman who I was working with in, uh, in a hostel in Cusco walked in and said, I met the most wonderful shaman. We're gonna take San Pedro. She was Italian. Um, and, and I said, okay. Okay, I, I don't know what San Pedro is. <laughs> Ten hours sounds like a lot, but you know I'm in, uh, and and uh, that's that's how San Pedro found me. I think. I love that. You know, that's that's similar to my experience with plant medicine. Is it kind of, if I'm paying attention, it guides me to it in the timing, the location, and yeah. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Is to to learn how to pay attention. Yeah. Instead of just sort of beating your head against the wall in the wrong direction. <laughs> so I haven't tried San Pedro. I'd love to hear whatever you feel comfortable sharing about your experience of it. Um, I, you know, I, I imagine like any plant medicine, different people have different experiences, but I should sure love to hear what you're willing to share. Certainly. Yeah. Um, so you know, of course, we can't reduce San Pedro to its alkaloid content, but um, mescaline, which is the primary alkaloid, is um, uh, the same same alkaloid that's found in peyote, uh, and it's it's a phen phenethylamine, um, which is actually closer to sort of MDMA uh, style hallucinogens than to tryptamine style hallucinogens like mushrooms or ayahuasca. So. Um, you know, both in, in chemistry and in experience, uh, San Pedro is a very, very loving medicine, very heart opening. Um, and, you know, certainly can be strict and, and certainly can be um, very, very intense, but uh, there's just this really incredible edge of, of love and, and approach that, that comes through love, um, which I find, you know, it's it's really what I needed at the time when I when I first came to San Pedro, um, and I think it's it's what so many people need. You know, um, we spend so much time time in our and you know, sort of wrestling with these these thoughts and uh, you know the the Quechua, the native Andean word for for San Pedro is Wachuma, which uh, actually means decapitated. So you know, instead of even dealing with those thoughts, uh, 
your head's sort of taken off and, and you become, you become heart, you become love. Um, and so from my experience, um, San Pedro is very, very loving and also um, absolutely inclined towards freedom. Uh, and I think that combination of, of love and freedom, um, you know, that's what we need to be whole in ourselves, uh, but then not in sort of this very individualistic sort of, um, you know, I don't need anybody kind of way, but in a way that, that brings us into connection and communion with other people and with plants and with the land. And, and that's what my work is. And that's what I see more than anything is missing uh, for so many people is that connection with, with everything, mm. with land, with, with plants, with people. So would you say the freedom is about freedom to be your full self or freedom to connect deeply with everything or both? Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm sure it's different for everybody, so I can only speak to my experience. Um, but for me, it's, it's freedom from thoughts and beliefs, right. uh, freedom from shoulds, yeah. um, freedom from culture in a way. Mm -hmm. um, you know, which is, is sort of interesting because I'm studying anthropology and studying culture uh, and I'm fascinated by sort of the, the cultural um, place in which San Pedro is, is situated and interwoven with. Um, but I think um, the freedom that I have found with San Pedro is the, is the freedom from, from culture, mm -hmm. freedom from shoulds. Yeah. Have you done ayahuasca? Uh, once yeah. I was with the Sacha people in Ecuador, and and it wasn't it wasn't an enormously strong experience, mm. um, but very beautiful. I just returned from Mexico a few weeks ago, doing ayahuasca there, and you know I had a kind of decapitating kind of experience as well. With <laughs> in in terms of I my experience of ayahuasca is that it's showing it's showing me how what happens when i get too lost in my thoughts and, mm -hmm. and and what the difference is when i can be more in my heart and then i think it's also helping to clear the things that are um keeping me from being fully in my heart so there's a mm -hmm. i think there's a clearing but at the same time there's a teaching you know when i get lost in my head and my thinking ayahuasca shows me sometimes in really difficult ways look how painful you, it is right now and you know qu try to quiet that and come back into the heart and... how beautiful and I, I feel like you you bring up something um so important there which is that so much of of this healing or um, cleaning or whatever it is is not is it really in the body? You know, it's mm -hmm. it's very physical, and mm -hmm. and you know I can't speak to ayahuasca because I, I don't I don't know ayahuasca. Um, but with San Pedro, it's it's so tactile, it's so physical, so um, you know you feel the plant in, in every cell of the body, and and the cleaning happens or the the healing happens through the body rather than than necessarily as much uh, through the mind. Mm -hmm. Well, I look forward to my opportunity whenever it comes. Uh, so can you tell me more about how, so first of all, you said, I think you said it's, a, it's generally 10 hours, the ceremony, is that right? Yeah, yeah uh, and, and traditionally that's, you know, from sundown to sunup more or less, yeah. so. Uh, at night, all night, and you know, some people, you know, it's eight eight hours, and and of course, you know, them you can feel the medicine for days, weeks afterwards. Is there chanting and so on that goes all night too, or? Um, yeah. So you know, San Pedro is is quite interesting in a way, um, because it's worked with in so many different uh settings mm. but there's not sort of this uh there's not a super strong uh sort of indigenous 
cultural tradition that has been described anyway that we know of mm -hmm. um, that that sort of incorporates ancient songs or anything like that. Um, the sort of the north coast of Peru where where this this healing cults uh, around San Pedro sort of exists uh, there. They sing what are called tarjos, um, which are are songs or chants, but they're very much um, you know, in some cases Catholicized, in some cases, um, you know, sort of uh, channeled through through the healer. Um, and so it's it's sort of not, uh, they're not comparable to the Icaro with ayahuasca mm -hmm. uh, in that way. Okay. Um, but these these ceremonies, uh, at least in the in the North Coastal uh, healing cult in Peru are um, sort of very, very defined, very um, sort of segmented with time. They're they're sort of performed around a central altar called a, a mesa, uh, which has artes uh, or you know sort of uh, ancient objects or uh, meaningful objects, healing objects, power objects, um, um, you know staffs, stones, bones, crystals, um, statues, um, pictures of saints, uh, different plants, coca leaves, um, and uh, so there's there's really a um, sort of a, a progression. There's a, a sort of a cleaning and a, um, you know, a, a healer will see, you know, several patients at a time and sort of cycle through the patients throughout the night. Mm -hmm. um, so that's sort of the, the more orthodox or what you could call a tradition uh, around San Pedro mm -hmm. in Peru anyway. Okay. Yeah. And did you finish that ceremony with this clear sense of, okay, this, this is what I want to study, or did, did you, I know sometimes for plant medicine, there's actual guidance. And how did you come out of that knowing that your life was going to be all different? That first ceremony? Or was it the first ceremony or was it another ceremony? Or? Yeah, it was the first and then, yeah, the, the first two more or less. Um, uh, and yeah, I'd say immediately I knew it, it was interesting because um, I, the, my intention going into that ceremony, uh, you know, because I was at the end of my trip and I was, you know, supposed to be sort of going back to North America and, you know, finding, you know, was I going to work in biology? What was I going to do? Um, and so that was in a lot of ways, my intention um, going into the ceremony was what am I going to do with my life? What am I going to do with this next little bit anyway? Um, and I thought I didn't get an answer to that. You know, the, the first ceremony and I was like, gosh, no, no voice sort of came out of the ether and said, here's what you're going to do. <laughs> um, and but it it wasn't a sort of a, a command or a dictation. And I don't think I would have trusted a command or a dictation. Um, you know, it was a feeling mm -hmm. and it, and it was, a you know, it was sort of like playing hot or cold, you know, moving into this feeling that there was something with San Pedro that I, I needed to pursue. Um, and, you know, I, I didn't have any idea at the time that that would be any sort of a, um, career or lead me in any direction that society sort of thought was acceptable. But um, I think moving towards that feeling and with every choice, making the choice that felt more like that feeling mm. uh, of being connected to land and to plants and to people. Um, and yeah, so, you know, within a couple months, I'd started to do a little bit of, of research about San Pedro. Um, Quite a bit of research actually and realize quite quickly that there just isn't a whole lot of information um you know there were there was sort of an ethnography um a study done in in the 70s by a wonderful man named douglas sharon um that he, um you know was was great but sort of looked at a a small percentage of of um where people were using San Pedro, the, how people were working with San Pedro. Um, and I realized, you know, this is wide open. There's so, so much that hasn't been learned. There's so much that hasn't been um, investigated or written. And 
And it's, it's tough, right? Because so much of what the plants teach us cannot be written, cannot be investigated, cannot be formed in hypotheses and, and objectives and answers. Um, but that's, that's a fun challenge in itself, right? right. <laughs> so how did you land? Uh, it, yeah, did, was there a specific thing that led you to decide, I, I want to do a PhD in this? Or did you? Um, yeah, another sort of very synchronistic um, event, uh, which was, you know, as I came back from the trip and sort of uh, was starting to to look into all of this, I came across the work of Wade Davis, um, who's my mentor and, and his writings um, on anthropology and ethnobotany. And um, I saw that he had just accepted a position as a professor at the University of British Columbia, which is where I'd considered doing my undergrad. Um, so I sent an email and said, hey, can I come talk to you? And the minute that the word San Pedro came out of my mouth, his eyes lit up. Oh, yeah. and, uh, uh, and, it, and it was sort of like, yeah, let's, let's study this. Let's, let's do this work because it hasn't been done. And it's, it's so important. And it's something that, um, you know, each personally we're very passionate about. Um, uh, and, and also that, you know, sort of the, the culture at large um, right now, it's, it's sort of the first opening in a little while that there's been to study this, these sorts of things. Yeah, so. yeah. I, I must say, Wade Davis uh, impresses me a lot. I saw him talk also at the conference. And, wow. Does he always speak in just rolling complete sentences, just <laughs> nonstop with no ums, buts, you know, <laughs> yep. <laughs> I mean, it, clearly he's a speaker and he's done it a lot and he's well uh, mastered the art. Yeah. yeah, it's it's kind of a lot to to try to live up to. <laughs> um, but inspiring yeah. certainly. Yeah. Yeah, well, uh congratulations. I mean, I can't I, I mean, I'm not that connected to the world of anthropology, but I, I can't imagine much better uh, supervisor than Wade Davis for what you're wanting to do. And he's, you know, I, as far as I know, he's traveled a lot in different parts of the world studying medicinal traditions and, and so on. So, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, and and truly there's, there's no more perfect person to supervise this project um, just for, you know, the, so many people in in academia, and and you know, academia is wonderful. Um, you know, we it's it's so cool that that we all you know can just sit in a room and talk about how the world works, and have that be justification, you know, in itself for for what we're doing because we're curious about the world. Um, but I think really what Wade brings to uh, UBC and to the academic community is uh, really honest, lived personal experience, mm -hmm. um, experience with the plants, experience uh, with people, you know, none of this sort of idealized um, or, you know, removed or sort of um, looking at everything from a step back, but a really, really honest experience and, um, you know, love for the people and the cultures that he works with, um, and 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 passion for what he does, mm -hmm. uh, and I think that's that's what San Pedro needs mm -hmm. as well. So, on that note, can you tell us a bit about your time? You were four months uh, in Peru as part of your studies. Is that right? Yeah, well, let's see. So that, that wasn't part of my studies. Oh, it wasn't, um, um, right, so two, it was two years ago exactly that I had San Pedro for the first time. And then a year ago, um, I went back and spent March through July uh, in Peru and Ecuador um, and worked with uh, different curanderos and um, 
and then I was uh, back in in Peru and Ecuador in December uh, as well uh, as part of my studies mm -hmm. conducting research. Um, so um, really what, you know, the, the second trip that I took, which I more or less took specifically to work with San Pedro um, was <laughs> um, an enormous amount of healing, mm. an enormous amount of, of shedding a lot of crap that I didn't need anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and it was work, <laughs> yeah. um, but it was, it was really, really joyful work usually. <laughs> Um, so, uh, and I think what I really gained from that trip as well was, um, sort of an, an understanding that's not so much an intellectual understanding, but really a, a heartfelt, um, intuitive understanding of, uh, what it is that, that makes the Andes so special and that makes people feel so hole there um and and it's really that you know it's not that there are all of these these sort of separate players uh that give to each other and take from each other and give to each other and take from each other um you know the the humans the land the uh, the livestock the alpacas the plants um you know, it's it's not all of these sort of separate personalities interacting with each other. It's it's one. It's Earth. It's Ayu. It's community, um, and it is relationship. Um, you know, the the most basic element is relationship, and out of that, individuals emerge, uh, and that's the greatest kind of belonging that I can imagine. Um, so that's. And, and, you know, I don't, I don't want to idealize this, you know, there, there are a lot of problems in Andean communities, um, but um, I think at their heart, that's, that's what makes the Andes so, so special. Mm -hmm. I've heard that the ayahuasca is becoming a, a bit uh, a tourist draw, and that's, I, I don't know any of this firsthand, and this is just what I've heard, but that that creating some challenges or some things to be really wary of. And, and I wonder, is, is it similar with San Pedro? Are people going there specifically to do San Pedro ceremonies? Is it a similar kind of thing that's happening? Yeah, you know, um, San Pedro hasn't had quite this enormous rush that that ayahuasca has had, you know, um, and I've wondered why that is. I think ayahuasca is sort of that, you know, very dramatic sort of punch through the brick wall, like very, um, you know, you're, you're going to get results. <laughs> um, and, and I think that's very much what our culture values in, in North America is the, you know, the, the direct path, you know, if you want to get to the top of the mountain, you know, just shoot me up there instead of you know sort of holding my hand and, and walking me up there right. um so no san pedro has not uh, gotten the attention that ayahuasca uh has and and i think part of that also is um just the the relative inaccessibility of the andes compared to um you know the jungle the the rubber trade uh, all of the the people who were who were in the jungle quite early on, um, but I, I guess there are sort of two two camps of San Pedro uh, in Peru, and and one of them is um, you know these very Catholicized rituals, um, the curanderismo of the north coast, um, and and people from all over Peru, and actually people from all over South America um, visit these curanderos. Mm -hmm. um, to, to be healed, um, you know, whether it's something mental, emotional, physical, um, just bad luck, uh, issues in a relationship, um, people seeking magic, people seeking healing. Um, and and they pay, you know, these, these curanderos charge so much. It's, mm. I mean, they're, uh, they're specialists and they, uh, you know, work on certain cases and there's a, there's an enormous amount of um, tourism just from from people in Peru and from South America who visit those curanderos to, to heal. Um, Are you talking about San Pedro or ayahuasca? 
Oh, yeah, yes, yeah, sorry, San Pedro. San Pedro. Yeah. And yeah. curanderos is, um, is, is a word for healer. Does it kind of translate to shaman as well? Yeah. More, or? Less, More or less, yeah. Curandero just means, yeah, means cure. Okay. So healer. Um, so sort of as, uh, as ayahuasca has been discovered, as um, San Pedro has been discovered more, there's sort of this, this camp of um, new age San Pedro ceremonies that are cropping up, especially in the Sacred Valley near Machu Picchu, near Cusco. Mm. Um, and there are some people doing fantastic work there um, with, with San Pedro. Um, but there's, you know, it's, it's either sort of blended with the uh, the Misha shamanism of the South, which traditionally just incorporated coca and not San Pedro. Um, people are using San Pedro with that kind of uh, shamanism now. Um, uh, you know, and then there's there's a lot of tour operators and retreat center operators uh, that cater to spiritual pilgrims in in the Sacred Valley. Right. So, and and you know, I don't. I don't think that's a bad thing. Um, you know, it's it's certainly you know c can be problematic when there uh, when there are people who are just trying to make money off San Pedro, yeah. um, just as with as with ayahuasca. Yeah. Um, but I think there there are good things happening as well with that. Hmm. So, for your experience, were you were you traveling around? A little bit, or were you trying to be trying to kind of be with one particular community and get more involved in a particular community? Yeah, so I spent uh, quite a while in the Sacred Valley, um, and I I also spent time in um, in Ancash in Central Peru, um, and then also in in Ecuador. So I. I traveled around quite a bit um, and, you know, sort of uh, got a little more understanding of how San Pedro is used in, or in different places. Um, and, and it's, it's so interesting the way that, um, you know, I, I was just thinking about the, uh, yesterday, actually, just how, you know, ayahuasca is very, you know, ayahuasca is, is you know everywhere from Colombia to to Peru, um, you know all through the jungle to Brazil to over an enormous area, um, but it's all very much in the forest in the jungle, um, and uh, you know which is very biodiverse and which changes a lot. Um, but but it's it's always in in sort of this low forest in the Amazon basin, um, and San Pedro really you know it's native to sort of the mid elevation and these, you know, 6,000 feet to 10,000 feet. Um, but it's been sort of propagated in these low coastal valleys, you know, all up and down the coast, um, you know, in river valleys, it grows in places with tons of rain. It grows in places with no rain. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, so it's, and also it's, it's become sort of this popular ornamental house plant around the world. Um, so it's it's so adaptable and so sort of suited to so many different environments uh, and you know different different phenotypes are different um, you know grows different spines different colors uh, you know whatever mm -hmm. um, but really can can adapt to so many different environments and, mm -hmm. and so many different cultures and different places and and I think that's that adaptability is such a, a gift mm -hmm. of San Pedro. Mm -hmm. And for people who don't know, uh, who might be interested, ayahuasca is two different vines, I believe, that get cooked together. And San Pedro is a cactus, right? Cactus, yeah. Okay. So quite different <laughs> types of plants. <laughs> yeah. 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 So some something in your talk that I want to check if I understood, because I really think it's huge if, if I got this right that as you started studying the history of of those regions, there was a period you found where no war shows up in the in the artwork and and so on. 
and that you're wondering maybe if San Pedro being such a heart-based medicine is, had an influence on the culture of, <clears throat> of this period where there was no signs that have been found around the war. Am I getting that right? Yeah, so, um, yeah, it's, uh, and it's, it's again, easy to, to sort of idealize um, any, any culture, but um, this, about 4,000 years ago in the Andes, um, there was sort of this, this culture that coalesced out of what looks like nothing, you know, there were sort of um, all of these isolated groups of nomads living throughout the Andes, uh, you know, starting to uh, do some agriculture, starting to, you know, do a little bit of art, starting to work with ceramics a little bit, um, but, you know, very isolated. Um, and, and all of a sudden, sort of out of the ether, um, 4,000 years ago, we see this great sweep of culture just, uh, you know, rush through the Andes and sort of unite all of these isolated groups of people in this huge network of religious pilgrimage uh, with sort of nodes of ceremonial sites uh, connected by footpaths, uh, you know, it's like a swath of mountains like the size of California. Um, and so there's, it's been this enormous mystery, one of the greatest mysteries in South American archaeology, really, you know, what was this culture? What sort of sparked that? Um, what, what happened? Uh, and what we see is that uh, exactly during that time, uh, San Pedro shows up mm. in the art. Mm. Um, it shows up in ceramics, shows up in stone carvings uh, in temples. Um, and it's, it's quite clear that this culture was using uh, San Pedro, was work, working with San Pedro as, as well as, um, you know, probably Anna de Nentra, uh, Yopo snuff uh, as well, but primarily San Pedro. Mm. Um, and, and so, yeah, certainly, certainly there's this question of, uh, you know, this, this very unique culture, which indeed showed all of their art showed ceremonial scenes, showed religion, showed, um, you know, sort of this, this very sacred ceremonial worldview, uh, and not, not a whole lot of weaponry, not a whole lot of, uh, military scenes, uh, none of these sort of very valuable, um, temples that many people passed by were fortified. Hmm. Um, you know, there's no evidence of, of military. Um, so, and that's fascinating because that culture, you know, sort of persisted for at least a millennium. Hmm. Um, uh, but then, you know, later on there, there's sort of a succession of, of coastal cultures, the Moche, Chimu, um, Paracas, Nazca, um, that, that did, uh, that warfare was, you know, more of a, um, driving force in their societies and they were also working with San Pedro. So it's, it's, mm. it's hard to say, um, it's quite hard to say, but, but sort of for that initial spark that, uh, you know, what was it that sort of coalesced people into this, really this artistic renaissance, um, this enlightenment really. Um, I, and I think it's a good bet that that was San Pedro. Are you familiar with the work of Graham Hancock? I'm not. Okay. It, it makes me think of, he, he writes, uh, I'm reading his book right now, Fingerprints of the Gods, and uh, mm -hmm. he writes a lot about South America, and he's writing more about, I think, kind of 11 to 15,000 years ago, and wow. he's, he's um, well, not only that, but he's, he's basically making an argument for the possibility that there was a, an advanced civilization back then that um, passed that that I think if I have this right that kind of disintegrated from the ice age or something and but did their best to pass along a lot of their technology and thinking to more primitive 
cultures, more hunter gatherer cultures. And, and that's why some of the huge monolithic um, structures and so on pyramids and that were, were built with massive stones and, you know, there's, he has, he has, he's not able to prove it, but it's a fascinating argument he makes that, uh, I like, I like this one too. <laughs> Graham Hancock, I'll check it out. Yeah. Yeah, there's really good talks with him on YouTube, and uh, and I really enjoy his writing as well. So, oh, fantastic! Yeah. So, what are you uh, working with in your research? To are you? Is that what you're developing? The effects of San Pedro on culture, or where is your research going? Yeah, so um, I'm in interdisciplinary studies, which means I get to sort of put my feet in a lot of fields. Um, so sort of half the project uh, is looking at this anthropological, uh, cultural, ethnographic um, work and half of it uh, is is exploring uh, the this uh, psychology uh, and the, the healing that, that people who work with the plant uh, experience. Mm. Uh, you know, because, you know, finally they're quite a few studies with ayahuasca, um, you know, or, or getting to be anyway, um, and some really wonderful research coming out of ayahuasca, but uh, this work has never been done with San Pedro. Nobody has, has um, examined the psychology of, of the San Pedro state, uh, or the, the many San Pedro states, I should say. Um, so we, uh, in December, uh, did pilot interviews. Um, I uh, attended a ceremony in Ecuador with about uh, 16 participants uh, and uh, spoke with 12 of them uh, about sort of of what they they experienced uh, and mostly what's coming out of those interviews uh, is you know of course this this great connection to love. Um, but also a, a real kinship with the natural world, kinship with trees, with plants, uh, with the other participants in the ceremony. Um, and and a, a third uh, thing that, that is, is quite interesting, uh, that I found quite interesting was uh, several of the participants talked about uh, having this really enhanced um, understanding of human placement. Um, so, you know, really understanding, um, it, and in fact, three out of the 12 of them specifically mentioned uh, sort of this verticality that we have, uh, that they felt uh, that our, our heads, our sort of upper bodies are connected with uh, the stars, with, with the sky, with sort of the celestial uh, god realm, um, and, you know, our lower halves are connected with the earth and we are, we are the connectors. We are sort of this plane of connection uh, that exists between upper and lower uh, in the universe. And um, for me, this, well, it, this really echoes uh, sort of the Andean view of the universe where there are three parts, um, Hanan Pacha, the, the upper celestial realm, uh, Uku Pacha, which is the, lower realm where the, the ancestors live. Um, and then Kaipacha, our world, um, humans as the connectors between upper and lower. Um, and so so several of the participants in this particular ceremony actually were, you know, described and drew this, this structure, um, you know, of where they understood humans to be in, in this sort of three-part world uh, or upper, lower, and, and humans is the interface. Um, so that's, that's something really fascinating that came out of those December interviews. Hmm. Uh, um, you know, I, I'm just sort of, as I hear that, I'm really reflecting on this sense that you were sharing of your experience of just feeling so much of the connection to more of life and and I really think that a lot of Western society has lost that, obviously, and are kind of stuck in a 
more of the left hemisphere of the brain and in uh, the doing, achieving, solving, linear approach to life. And it seems like the, you, you've had this incredible uh, opening and shift. You know, I don't know if that was your experience too. Uh, even if I think about maybe molecular biology being a very specific, detailed study, and now you're really opening up into uh, <laughs> much wider perspectives and deeper perspectives and it's kind of it's, Definitely. It's, it's really neat though that because of course we need the left hemisphere in the details so you can bring all of that into it as well and, yeah. yeah it's it's so interesting right like i i love science because um you know i i love to to explore and things that that people haven't thought about before that people have, humans haven't known before mm -hmm. um, and I think we all have that curiosity to know things that we haven't known before um, and so sort of the reductionist model of science which uh, you know I, I worked in for years and um, in some ways you know have a lot of respect for um, is sort of looking smaller and smaller and smaller to find new unknowns mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, at some point you just, you know, there, there's a sort of, a, you get as small as you can go and, and then you're tiny, you know, and, um, I think sort of be going the other way, sort of, ex um, examining that human consciousness, um, I think is, is the next great unknown, you know, this, this frontier, you know, now that we've explored every corner of the planet, more or less, um, except maybe the oceans, um, you know, consciousness is what we can explore. And each of us has access to that, you know, right here, or right here. Um, you know, it's some, something that, that anybody can ask questions about and have direct experience to answer. Yeah. And I, I think it's a, an incredibly beautiful thing to, to, to come into believing uh, and to knowing that, that what brings us the most joy is also what the world needs most. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would say to someone who's brand new to plant medicine and, you know, mm -hmm. are thinking about what's coming out more and more these days is this research, particularly on healing uh, addictions or PTSD. And, you know, they're having quite good results with all kinds of different um, psychedelics. And yeah, I'm just curious if you have, if, if, if there are people out there who are quite new to this kind of world and, or, Getting Certainly, curious, yeah. what, what would you say? Oh gosh, a lot of things come to mind. Um, I guess one is, um, I think we really have the chance with this sort of third wave of research that's happening now uh, with psychedelics to do things differently than we've done before. And that means not sort of cutting off a piece of the world and killing it so that we can look at it more closely. Um, not, not taking things out of context to, to imagine that we might understand them better that way. Um, so, yeah, so I would say, um, you know, let's, let's be aware of, of anything that is, that does not recognize the essential interconnectedness of of everything that that we're examining because you know what we're looking at you know psychedelics they show us the essential interconnectedness and uh and so let's not you know look at a, a study where uh, you know somebody took a psilocybin pill although you know these are wonderful wonderful studies um but you know and assume that that tells us everything there is to know about psychedelic, you know, the vast field of psychedelics. Um, you know, there's, 
it's it's infinity and and you know several infinities in fact um and so i'd say yeah let's let's be really careful um about what we uh the assumptions that we're making um and and sort of along with that um i think any substance that or any any plant or fungus that people are using um we they ought to grow um you know anything that we are using as a medicine um we should have contact with its living form um and so you know san pedro for example is you know you can buy at home depot san pedro is everywhere mm. um and and growing the plant um i think provides that deep connection that that people are so often missing when they when they start to get into the, the plant medicine world so they think you know it's it's sort of um a realm that that the shaman deals with that uh you know the facilitator deals with and they're just there to receive medicine but i think uh developing that personal um relationship with the medicine by growing the medicine and by providing for the medicines you know life and and proliferation is is really important mm. and i guess it's sort of the the third thing that comes to mind um right off the bat is you know a lot of a lot of people can can do a lot of things that look really magic look really paranormal or um you know magic um but you know let's let's not lose sight of of what we're really going for which is healing mm -hmm. and connection and peace and truth and i think in the plant medicine world it's so easy for people to have a, a scary vision or to encounter some darkness um, and become fascinated by it um, and certainly yeah do the shadow work you know look into the shadows but but let's not forget what we're really looking for here which is is peace mm -hmm. and and the way to know if something is true is you know is it does it feel peaceful mm. does it feel like peace i love that wow thanks so i'm sorry that was sort of a long answer no i i, I loved all of it um I think the thing that I would like to add actually is comes back to one of your points about in our culture, how we want to get the result and get to the top. And, and I want to emphasize that healing for me, and I think for most of us is an ongoing, probably lifelong journey that um, there's lots of ways to, to do healing and uh, plant medicine is an important one for me, but it's part of a picture of ongoing healing. And it, it doesn't, it doesn't, um, you know, it doesn't fix everything right away. It's, it's uh, healing is just an ongoing practice and journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's such an incredible point. And, and if, you know, I've come to, to feel anything really deeply, especially in the last you know, a couple of months in, in my first year of grad school, it's that it's not about product. It's not about what you hand in at the end of the day. It's not about um, sort of the, the finished creation or the next thing. It's, it's about the lived process of infusing everything we do with joy every day, you know, to, to the extent that we can. Mm -hmm. Well, that uh, I think is a wonderful place to finish right there, infusing everything. Mm -hmm. Is there any? Thank you. So much. Yeah, thank you. Are there any things that you want to point people to in terms of a website or? I don't. I don't think so. Um, I've been, and probably sometime this uh, summer or fall, um, we'll be getting things a little more. Um, you know, perhaps a, a Facebook page or something, but um, got some more work to do before that. Please so. let me know if you put that together. Yeah. Is there a Wade Davis <laughs> book you would recommend for people? Oh my gosh. Um, the Wayfinders is a really good one to, 
to start uh, it's a collection of essays from the Massey lectures in 2009 and um, the Wayfinder is fantastic yeah yeah thank you um, so much Laurel really, really thank you Eric yeah. this is such a pleasure yeah. and uh, I hope to hear you talk again someday soon likewise take good care you too we'll see you bye-bye